We're in the book of Acts, chapter 9 is where we will start today, and chapter 9 is a uh, fairly pivotal uh, change in the book of Acts because we're going to be introduced to Saul, or Paul, in a more detailed way, just to kind of reorient us to what it was like before, uh, before we jump in, and pray and then jump in, is... Uh, Pentecost, there's a couple different, pen, different give, you know, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, different Pentecost. One is the, the traditional one, which is the Holy Spirit coming to, uh, in Acts chapter 2, that's predominantly Jews, uh, who, Jewish Christians. And then we are introduced to, a few chapters later, to the rise of the Hellenists. Now, they're, they're Hellenist Jews. Uh, and then with Philip, you actually get a Gentile. And he's the eunuch uh, in Ethiopia. Now, we think he's a Gentile. It could be Jewish as well because there's a heavy concentration of, of, of Jewish population also in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, actually, there are different major areas of Christianity in, in the early church, of Christianity in the early church, and Ethiopia is one. Alexandria, which is the, up around the, where the Mediterranean and the Nile come together, that's another major one. Obviously, Jerusalem. Antioch, you've heard Antioch's one, and then you've got the, the areas in Turkey, particularly the seven churches that we have in the book of Revelation, and then eventually Rome would become a, a major powerhouse seat of Christianity, all within the first hundred years. I mean, cr- the, the gospel's spreading. But in chapter 9, we have, now we're introduced to Saul a little bit with the martyrdom of Stephen. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh Saul I mean uh, chapter 9 is sort of a we pick Saul back up from what happened with the the death of Stephen so that's hopefully will orient us back since it's been a a number of weeks since we last met before we pray and begin are there any questions or things that are still foggy or maybe something that we've uh, uh maybe need to sort of pay attention to before we jump back in all good any announcements? Forgot to ask for those. So I guess not. Well, let's pray and, and we'll begin. Oh God, as we now direct our time and our attention to our, our text this morning, uh, Acts chapter 9, what we pray for is a number of things that we would, um, we want to be fully present here. So the things that are just a part of our life that we carry with us, if there is, even for just a, a number of moments to Park those at the door for uh, at least this time and, and focus in on the text. We want the text to be used by you in such a way, your spirit, so that it continually forms the, the nature of Christ inside of us. Um, faith is meant to be dynamic. Uh, it's fluid. Uh, so there's a maturation process. And so we want to pray for uh, our growth in faith. And we know that study is a part of it. So what you do with the text that then gets applied into us through your spirit, that's what we want, what we pray for. Uh, For those that are um, had surgeries or maybe facing surgeries or treatments, those that are in the hospital or are just um, sick and ill during this time of the year, we pray for uh, their bodies and for their families and those that are watching over them. Uh, Bless them all, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 9. Now, just to kind of orient you to the screen, so Stephen is in this area when he dies. They're all in Jerusalem. And then uh, under Philip, we have the gospel, or at least uh, Philip and then Peter up in this area where the gospel's spreading. Um, And then the text leaves here, and we pick Saul up, who's on his way to Damascus. That's what we have in chapter 9. Um, when we finish the conversion of Saul and we move into chapter 10, we're going to be back over in this area in the Joppa, what is now Tel Aviv, uh, and that whole area. Uh, but just So we're dancing around in the book of Acts, this northern part of Israel in, and into Syria. So Acts chapter 9, if someone... Uh, this. Is if your if your uh, Bibles have chapter headings, this will probably read something along the line of the conversion of Saul or Saul to Paul, things of that nature. 
Uh, but if somebody would read for us verses 1 through 9, uh, we'll jump, or actually let's do 1 through 7. We'll jump right into the text. All righty. Still a mark. Well, I'm looking for the big markers, which we do not have. Yes, yeah, exactly right. Just show off in the new year, you know. So. I'm sorry, Betty. Can you repeat that? So I mean, uh, we uh, obviously we've changed our markers, and they're the more of the fine point, which is not good so in my mind so anyways we'll just make do with what we got all right so we have this idea of um we have this idea of the conversion of Saul again he's he's on his way from Jerusalem and he's moving up to Damascus uh because that's where uh at least he has insight to where there is a a Jewish Christian community um uh, so he's on route. Now, we don't know exactly where. It's pretty close to Damascus. We can at least make that conclusion. Um, but he uh, has some level of um, extradition papers from the high priest. Actually, the high priest in Jerusalem, going back to around 6 AD, uh, had some level of arrangements with other governments that they could uh, for extradition rights, um, so this has long been established. So Paul, I mean Saul, is it, this is not anything new that he received that's different than what others would have received during that day. But he's on the way um, to Damascus after what we call these followers of the way. Uh, incidentally, that's one of the first titles of Christian. I mean, Christians uh, is a late title. Uh, we have in, in in the Bible and, and amongst the the people who follow Christ, um, and it actually the 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 term Christian is something that outsiders uh, call those who are insiders at, because they're little Christ. They they you know it's sort of a derogatory you know kind of like Methodists. I don't know if you know the origin of the of Methodists. Y'all familiar with that? Yes or no? Okay, so um, let's jump from Paul. 1700 years to England um, everybody's Anglican all right so there, there is no Methodist church they're Anglican or or they're uh, uh, well in England they're Anglican they're Church of England that, that going back to Henry VIII remember that whole stuff in all your history lessons so you have the Anglican Church Church of England and the state religion is the Anglican Church and there there's a rise amongst different folks for some level of reform, revival, or renewal. A couple of them were John Charles Wesley and some other folks. They were all teachers in some form or fashion, either tied to um, Emory or, I mean, not Emory, tied to Oxford or tied to Cambridge. <laughs> Got to get it right. And uh, not in Atlanta, over there. And uh, part of what they, they created was what they call a holy club. And the idea stemmed from there's got to be something more than just state religion. And um, so they would meet weekly for Bible study. They would meet weekly for worship. They would meet weekly for accountability groups. Uh, they would meet weekly for to take the sacraments, communion. And people, other Anglicans, uh, to make fun of them, basically said, it's a derogatory term, that said, you think there's a method to your faith well the name stuck so uh that's where we get methodists from so now uh now you know so i mean uh but uh th but the term you know so so methodist one of the distinctives to to methodism is a high view of grace and through the means of grace that someone grows in their faith 
And so the idea of small groups, um, whether that be Sunday school uh, or what have you, th those, all that is, there's, you tend to the disciplines of the church that produces growth in your faith. Uh, but in the 1700s, it was considered a, you know, you're coming up with a method to, to grow in your faith. And, of course, the Wesley brothers and some of the other ones said, yeah, you're right, we are. I mean, this is what we're after. We're after a, a holiness of heart, which means inward holiness, and a holiness of life. You hear those terms, holiness of heart and life, which, and, and holiness is, in Wesley terms, is you cannot, it's not just personal holiness, uh, without social holiness, which means what you do out in the world, all of that's together. That, you know, the inward piety that a person has and an outward living out of that piety, you cannot separate the two. There should not be a disconnect. And so all that was tied into the early, uh, er, early DNA of Methodism. All right, so let's now go back to Saul. And you have these, these people of the way. And, and the idea was that outsiders who are looking now at insiders, those who are following Christ, that they either the way as in the way of Christ, eventually they are called Christians. There are other titles that they're called uh, or names that they're, they're given in, in the first, uh, in Acts and then also into, uh, into the first century. But the, one of the first ones is that they're followers of the way. Well, Paul, or Saul at this time, is after this group of people, followers of the way, who, have, who now have left Jerusalem because Stephen's martyred them. Uh, I mean, you know, if there's, and there's persecution. I mean, obviously Stephen is the, 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 the picture of that, but the, you now have religious leaders who are cracking down on, on these followers of the way, and so people have left Jerusalem and they're going to different cities. Well, there's, always, there's already an existing group uh, of believers at Damascus. Now, we don't know that in verse, verses 1 through 7, but when we get to Ananias, where did he come from? Well, he's already in Damascus, right? And he's already a believer. So we, we do know that there are people there. We do know that Damascus had a very large population of Jews in the city. Um, which mean, and this is Josephus. Have you ever heard of the name Josephus? Josephus is a first century Jewish historian, but he's, he's often cited. I mean, he's a pretty good historian. And, uh, and so Saul is going to Damascus. We know that uh, it has a number of synagogues. And again, where is Christianity starting? Where are they meeting at this point? They're meeting either in the temple or in synagogues. They're not... We don't get to them meeting outside of that until you get to Acts 16, where we're introduced to Lydia. All right, Lydia is a Gentile, and she's, they meet, they talk, they have worship services out by the river. But until we get to Acts 16, we're in established places of worship, either in the temple. Peter, remember Peter goes to the temple to pray there in appropriate times uh, throughout the day. Same thing in synagogues. So uh, Paul is after uh, these people, followers of the way. And there's a, we, do, we do know historically there's a group of them in Damascus. So then we move to Paul, or Saul's on his way, verse 3. And what happens? Right. He's on his way, going along and approaching Damascus, which we would then assume, since it says he's approaching Damascus, maybe he's over halfway. If not, it would say just out from Jerusalem. You know, but we, we assume that he's closer to Damascus than he is Jerusalem. And somewhere along in that pathway, um, he sees a light and what? All right, so one, one at a time, all right? So uh, I don't have my hearing aid in, so I mean, uh, you know. Uh, so he sees a light, but then what accompanies the light? A voice, that's right. So there's, there's visual, he sees, and then this auto he hears. So there's, there's, because there are other people that are with Saul that don't hear the same thing, but they see something, all right? So we don't know, I mean, we, we'll definitely, when we study chapter 22 and we study chapter 26, when Paul is giving accounts of his conversion experience, he talks about how he sees and he hears, but other people only see. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see how all this is playing out. But it's a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful event that, that took place around midday. We know that from later on when Paul talks about 
He sees a light. He hears a voice. And what does he hear? Right. Why are you persecuting me? And then what's his answer? Did we get that far? Yeah. So who are you? What is your, what did the Bible does it say? Who are you? Does some say, who are you, my Lord? All right. Does some say, who are you, sir? All right. So the word there, um, the word for Lord, as in lowercase l, is also a polite word like sir. Um, the, you know, the, if it's Lord as in Lord of all, as title, it's, it's normally capitalized. This is not. So, uh, who are you, my Lord? Or it could be some versions of the Bible say, who are you, sir? Because he doesn't know, right? I mean, if he knew that this was Jesus, he would have answered differently. Uh, I mean, at this point, obviously at this point in Paul's life, he's not ready to say that Jesus is Lord, capital L. Um, now, some scholars and what have you try to explain this experience uh, through maybe he has epilepsy or something like that or, or come up with some type of seizure or what have you. Uh, here's why I think that's not correct. Um, I mean, so take out whether or not you're a believer or not, all right? So don't, we don't want to read in because we're followers of Christ. We know a little bit about the story. Then we're going to, you know, automatically give, you know, we're going to lean towards uh, what God can do. But let's just assume we're going to park that at the door for a second, and we're just going to look at the text for, for what it says and what we know happens in Saul's life historically. You have a bona fide persecutor of the church. He has this vision where he sees something. It's accompanied by something that he hears, and then his life completely changes. All right? Now, could that be tied to a seizure? That may be, um, but I think it's hard to prove that because what you find in, in Paul is a total conversion of his will, a total conversion of his intellect, his emotion, complete turn 180 degrees, which then dictates the purpose of his life going forward. That's hard to prove just in one particular, say, physical seizure or what have you. Not to say that seizures aren't, you know, can, can be life-changing. But if, if there's not multiple seizures that happen, you know, down the road, it would, it would stand to reason that the more distance he, he was removed from that actual physical event, the more likely he would revert back to his old ways. Are you with me? Right? I mean, that's just, you know, diets only work for a little while, correct? Yeah, I mean, after a while, we forget the New Year's resolution. But if it is a total conversion, as described in the text, and you see a total change in his will, his intellect, and his emotion, then it would stand to reason that this is exactly what it says it is. That this is, he meets the resurrected Lord uh, on the road to Damascus, and it's accompanied by a conversation, at least in some form or fashion, uh, which then leads from unbelief to belief. All right? So... I just want to let you know that if you're reading some, some different accounts of the story that are non-canonical, which means they're not in the Bible, some try to explain this through various means and, and what have you. I, I think it's hard to justify those because of what ultimately happens inside of Paul's life. Um, you know, in this text at this moment, he just sees, he sees somebody or something He's not, you know, he doesn't know if this is the, the, the risen Christ or not, but it is accompanied by hearing something. Uh, and, but this later on, when he meets Ananias in verse 17 and Barnabas in verse 27, more is given by Paul, which then confirms what we have in verses 1 through 7. So we have to kind of keep the, all the text together, not just this, you know, these couple of verses. Um, the other travelers, again, we'll know this when we get to chapter 22. They did see the light that flashed suddenly around them. Uh, but for them, it was not accompanied with this, this binding uh, illumination inside of Paul, this enlightenment that Paul has now with Christ uh, that, that, that totally changes the type of person that he is. It diverts his zeal for persecution. And now that zeal is refocused into not just living out his faith, but promoting the faith of Christ. Now, 
want to stop here for a second because I want to leave the text because I want to ask a question. What brings this type of illumination or enlightenment or, you know, uh, aha experience, conversion experience? Um, so, you, you know, if someone was, didn't know anything about Christianity and they read this text and they said, you know, how does something like this happen? How would you answer it? I have presence of God, Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Power of God. Um, openness. What's interesting is none of you said the Bible. Or none of you said just go to church or read a book or talk to a counselor or whatever. I mean, you know, we can make a, a, you know, join the Tuesday morning Bible study. None of that came up. Um, it's not to say those aren't, this is, I'm, 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 this is impo- you know, to me, I think this is, this is important because I think this is how people change. All those things that God has given the church, the Bible being one, uh, worship, joining together in a community, all those things are gifts from God, disciplines that God has given to the church, but they are not the most important thing. It's what God does with those through the role of the Holy Spirit that actually produces change in the people. Are you with me? Um, I mean, the Bible itself is an insider's book. So if I, you know, if if Ruth is not a a follower of the way and I give her this Bible and say, here, read it, this is going to change your life, it might. But there's nothing magical inside the book as if to say if she reads the the black words on the white page that just by reading it, boom, there it is. She's going to change. Maybe. What makes the Bible inspired is what the Holy Spirit does with the book. What makes the worship inspired is what the Holy Spirit does with the worship. What makes the fellowship inspired is what the, what the Holy Spirit does with the fellowship. Because if, if it's not something that's added to the Holy Spirit... What's the difference between joining together in fellowship in the name of God and just going to dinner? I mean, because you're fellowship in either way, correct? Right? Or take communion. What If you go and eat bread and drink some juice or wine or whatever for lunch, what's the difference between that and then communion? It's the same stuff, Right? I mean, we actually have pretty good bread here at St. Paul. I don't know if you've ever taken communion. I mean, you know, St. Paul spares no expense when it comes to the communion elements, which I'm so grateful for. You know, I don't know. Uh, I grew up, you, you ate those little, it's like cardboard things. Oh, my word. And uh, now, th- now, the good news is in, in 20-something years of my ministry, we have evolved with even the, the cracker, all right? You know, early on, I mean, I'm not even sure what the, it was manna. All right, you know what manna in the Old Testament means? What is this, right? Go back and read, you know, Exodus says, I mean, manna, manna we think it's a quail. Well, no, it's not. It's, they don't even know what it is, you know. I mean, the Hebrew word for manna is, we really don't know what it is, so what is it? Well, it's kind of like bread. It's kind of like paste. I don't know. It all gets mixed together. Um, thankfully, they have, you know, whoever the, the company that makes the communion wafers, they, they, have, they have grown with the times, which is fantastic. The good news is St. Paul buys the Hawaiian bread. And, uh, you know, uh, during Wednesdays, we did a, this is back in the fall, uh, we uh, did some contemplative services. And um, uh, I forgot to, to get the bread, and so I went and bought the pita bread. Well, you would have thought that I had just, def- <laughs> you know, had, had poured paint on the altar. Right? You know what I mean? It's like... We're not getting the bread, you know. It's like, hey, this is what happens when you get a minister buying it, not a communion steward. You know, they know what they're doing. I don't. But so, my but my point is this: um, sometimes we can major in the minors, all right. And it's not to say that the minors, the gifts that God has given to the church for maturation of faith, for growth, it's not to say they're not important. They are, and they are. They are different authorities than just the average. But there's nothing, there's no efficacy in them unless the Holy Spirit is a part of it. And it it is really good for us to remember that over time. Because if we always focus in on the minors, 
then we get trapped in as if to say those things are, are forever have to be that way. Style of music and worship, right? It's another one. Style of worship, okay? Type of fellowship. Uh, and so we can get, we can get, we, we actually, I think we can limit God inside of the box that we think God should act and perform in, even with the Holy Spirit. So how much of the New Testament did Paul have? None. Now he had the Old Testament, which meant that he had the prophets, and he had the, the Torah, the first five books, and he might, he, but he probably did not have the historicals, your first and second kings, your chronicles, and things like that. Maybe. We don't know for sure. But he had the Torah, first five books, the law, and he had the prophets. But So we, you know, the reason why I want to highlight that as Protestants, which is, you know, we're all Protestants, I mean, I would imagine in here. And so, I mean, there's a, because we, we do put authorities up above some of the others, but we also have to remember that if the Holy Spirit is not using that to leverage the person of Christ inside of you, it is nothing more than just a book. It's just a record of people who followed God. What makes it inspired is because God breathes into the book through the Spirit, which then produces change in the person. Okay? I mean, it's, it's, we, we have to remember that. Now, we should, there should be also a sense of celebration and joy because it's what God can do with those things through the Holy Spirit. That what produces change is not just something that we can do, uh, but change has to come from God through the Holy Spirit. It's what the Holy Spirit does with the things that God has given us. Prayer, worship, the scriptures that actually can lead to some level of change inside the life of the person. Because what Paul doesn't have in this conversion is anything other than a personal experience with Jesus Christ right now. Now we lose track of him. For a couple of years, he goes off into the desert, probably to just make sure he's, you know, to leave, to be such an ardent persecutor of the church, to then to be, you know, just this full-on evangelist for the church. You know, I, I would argue that he's, he's laying that foundation, finding some evidence for his faith, uh, but he resurfaces again in Jerusalem. We just lose track of him for a little bit, according to the book of Galatians. I mean, Galatians says he, you know, kind of disappears for a little bit, and then he shows back up. So anyway, let me stop, because this, um, just open it up for questions uh, in, in case there might be. But, but it's important to realize what took place in Paul's life, and the one that's orchestrating this is the Holy Spirit, not, not something else. Yeah, so what, uh, he does have training in Old Testament, we, we know that. Um, we know that, um, we, we know he goes, he, he wants to talk, he talks to Peter, all right? Um, but there's, I mean, we don't know what happened when he's in the desert, all right? So uh, uh, my take is that he, you know, probably lost the history, but he is, you know, lining up some foundations for, for where he's at. Uh, but he does spend time in Jerusalem with, uh, with the apostles. Remember, they're scared in the very beginning because they, they know his reputation. Um, but we don't know. I mean, it's not like he carries, like I'm a, a disciple of so-and-so. That we don't know. All right, good question. Now, I, uh, I gave you an account of um, uh, Sundar this, this is from um, a book that I have that this is early 1900s but it's a similar story of someone who, who has a conversion experience close to, close to Paul because Paul's not the other one that has th that have these um, you know these what we call Pauline conversions, I mean this dramatic conversion from one way and then to another way.
one of the things that we'll we'll eventually get to when we get to Acts 15 that I think is a pivotal part in the Bible is particularly in the early church too is all right so you've got the beginnings of some non-Jews are starting to 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 come into the fold Paul we have Paul's conversion here immediately we'll leave Paul after chapter 9 and we go back to Peter and you have the uh, Cornelius' conversion who's a god fear, which is just straight up Gentile all the way around and uh, so then other Gentiles start coming to the, through the, to the faith and in Acts 15 they finally meet because it's creating some problems and um, one of the things that they decide all the apostles and some of the other church leaders is that there's this phrase and we get to it I'll point it out it says uh, we should make it easy for people to come into the faith uh, and so they only give the Gentiles, basically they send Paul out and say, you know what, just, you know, when you preach Christ, tell them to, to you know, to be mindful of, you know, don't commit adultery, uh, and be careful what you eat in public because of your witness. That's really all they give them. Uh, so, I mean, I think these are, these are great things that come out of the book of Acts. I think it's important for us that we, because some people have, they come to faith, and it is a, it's a, it's a, dramatic conversion all right my conversion was that way i didn't see a vision like paul but i mean i remember sitting in church on a sunday morning and uh i mean it was just like the light bulb went off and uh i mean it was totally i mean i to totally different so some people have conversions that are similar to paul some people have conversions where they've been a part of the faith community for just as long as they can remember and it's like the acts 15 the community around them has made it so easy that it's like taking from one step to the next. Both of them are valid and needed. Uh, unfortunately, we have a tendency inside the church to, you know, value one over valuing another, and that's really unfortunate. You know, I, I think the greater message is someone who grows up in the church as a, as a baby, and all they can remember is what it was like to be in the church, and then when they were old enough to make their own decisions, they naturally want to choose what has been fashioned and formed from them from day one. I mean, that, that picture to me is fantastic. I mean, it's the way it should be, that uh, just people have, have seen and tasted of the goodness of God, and when it comes time for them to sort of write their own narrative, why not? Uh, so there's not, it's, not one, it's not like one is, is lesser than the other. Um, Another, I don't know if you've ever heard the name Julian of Norwich. Oof, got to hurry. 14th century, um, 1300s. Uh, she, um, if you're not, if you haven't. Uh, really? Nope. Now, I turned it down because I had a little bit of uh, feedback. Um, well, perhaps we could... <laughs> Yeah, a little traveling music, that's right. So, uh, how about now? Is that better? Okay. Julian of Norwich. Uh, she's 14th century, maybe I think 1336, somewhere in the neighborhood. She uh, ends up uh, moving to a monastery when she was probably, I don't know, maybe teenager, late teens or something. She has, uh, she's on her, on her deathbed, and everybody thinks she's going to die. She has these visions while she's on her deathbed that are similar to like Paul, and it changes her life. And one of them, I'll just kind of read you a little bit. I, I, I like Julian of Norwich, uh, particularly this part of her life. She's asking God, obviously on her deathbed, about um, heaven and hell. All right? I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, I would imagine that if you know you're about to die, things like that are very important. And particularly around the issue of si sin. And so this is what she wrote. In my folly before this time, I often wondered why. By the great foreseeing wisdom of God, the onset of sin was not prevented. So really the idea is why was there just sin in the world? Why wouldn't God create a world where this, would not, this wouldn't be a part of it? It says, I thought as I, uh, for then, talking about thinking of a world that would be, why didn't God prevent that? I thought all should have been well, meaning that if, if God created a world without sin, then things would have been better. Um, says this impulse of thought thinking about that 
was much to be avoided, but never, nevertheless I mourned and sorrowed because of it without reason uh, or, or discretion. But Jesus, this talk, she talks about it in one of her visions, but Jesus, who in this vision informed me of all that is needed by me, answered with these words and saying, so this is, what, this is the vision that she had, it was necessary that there should be sin, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all matter of things shall be well. These words were said most tenderly, showing no matter of blame to me, nor to any who shall be saved. Uh, in this, she recognized the compassion that she had prayed for from, by God. Uh, she is impressed with her need to be joyful in all circumstances, however adverse. And for no particular reason except this, that all things will ultimately be put right by Christ. Uh, she comes to such a sense of, of allness of the destruction of sin um, to, to one who recognizes the horror of sin itself as just a living hell. And, but then she writes this, But to me was shown no harder hell than sin, for a kind soul has no hell uh, in it, uh, because all will be well and all will be made right by Christ. So uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Julian of Norwich, but I, I think she, she, that's just, I want to give you another, give you a couple examples of people who had these dramatic conversions that are similar to Paul, Paul's not being the only one. And what's interesting is when you read these different types of conversions, they all sort of end in the same way that uh, um, you have this vision of Christ and at the same time, the grace of God that is given because of Christ, which is what Paul, where Paul ultimately lands. All right, so that's a, kind of a, a lot going on. So let me stop and see if there's any questions here. All good? All right, so y'all need a break? Good? We can go for a couple more minutes or break? You tell me. Break? No? All right, we'll keep going then. All right, so uh, we'll take a break in about 10 minutes. Someone read, um, we read to verse 7, right? All right, so if someone would read through, uh, here, I'll just read 7 on down. Uh, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was there without sight and neither ate nor drank. So obviously we think he's close to Damascus. Um, he, he, uh, he was able to rise at some point. He was blind because of the, uh, uh, as a uh, result of, of the vision. And his companions took him in by the hand and led him into the city uh, to, to some place that was, uh, we would imagine, was already arranged for him to go. Uh, and he stayed there three days without eating or drinking um, versus... 10 through 12 let's see if we can get to those and then we'll call it a break um, now there was a disciple in damascus named ananias the lord said to him in a vision ananias and he answered here here i am lord and the lord said to him get up and go to the street called straight and at the house of judas uh, look for a man of tarsus named saul at this moment he is praying and he has seen a vision a man named ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight now, this is what I think is interesting, and, and I've seen this in my ministry so many times. You have God working with Saul over here, independent of anything else that Saul is aware of. At the same time, in verse 10 through 12, we know that God is working with Ananias, independent of Saul. Both of them have a vision, or both of them here for God, from, um, from God, because at some point, God wants to do something with with one, or both of them really but it's going to lead to the the furtherance of his kingdom uh, it's amazing to me how independent of each other you have god almost like a conductor who's working over here and then also working over there and eventually it leads to some crescendo or some major piece that ends up uh changing maybe what's going on in the surrounding area and in verses 10 through 12 saul's praying um, obviously, according to 10 through 12, it says he's praying and Saul sees another vision, right? So it's not just the first vision he had on the road. Now he has another vision where he's in the house. And this time he sees a guy named Ananias who he does not know come. Ananias is going to lay hands on him 
and his sight's going to be restored. So one of the questions I ask outside, of, you know, I jot down questions all the time in my Bible. Why two visions? I mean, why didn't God just show it to him all, you know, on the, on the front, on the first go? Yeah, so that's the answer is he had to prepare him. Yeah, right, absolutely. Sometimes uh, we don't need to see the whole scope. Now, we want it. That makes us less anxious, right? Uh, um, I remember someone asked me one time, how, you know, what, what's obedience? And I thought about giving all these theological answers, and then I finally came to this answer. Obedience is just doing the next right thing that's in front of you. And I wonder how often we get sidetracked because it's, we know what to do in this first step, but we're thinking 10 or 11 steps down the road. And their revelation, I think, comes in degrees uh, where you, and you're not, I don't think you get the next, it's like walking with a flashlight. Have you ever been out in the dark and you walk with a flashlight? You cannot see forever with a flashlight, but you can see just enough that's in front of you. But if you walk to where just enough is with the flashlight, guess what happens? Now you can see further down the road and further down the road. I think that's often how God leads us is that if we saw everything, you know, 10 steps down the road, I, I think that's too much. I, I don't think we, we have the ability to kind of to be faithful there. We get sidetracked. Um, but I, so I think sometimes it's just a step or two at a time. And if you just do that then you'll see another step or two and then another step or two uh, down the road. Um, <clears throat> interesting enough, the gospel has already made its way to Damascus, right? Because Ananias is already a believer. And yet at the same time, he is aware of the persecution uh, and the role that Saul played in Jerusalem um, because um, we don't, we I didn't read it, but we're going to get to where when we come back from the break, we get Ananias' answer which is going to be like, ooh, wait a minute, God. You sure you want me to do this? This guy kills people. Uh, so um, have any of y'all ever been to Damascus? I have not, but what, I mean, most scholars, you can still find the, the, the street called Straight that still exists. And uh, I was just curious if anybody had, had, has visited Damascus. Probably don't want to go there now. You know, probably polit Politically, it's not the best, you know. And if you did go, definitely don't put American, you know, on, on your forehead, or probably Christian, you know, so, uh, but from what, every everything I've studied, that that street called Straight is still the main thoroughfare inside of Damascus in some, some form or fashion. All right, so let's, any questions before we take a break? All good? A lot of information today, uh, just to kind of take in, and um, all right, well, let's take a break for about 10 or 15 minutes.
uh, go ahead and make our way back. So there should be a uh, prayer sheet going around, I think. Hey, Chris. Maybe. Second bell. Ah, uh, feel free. So we're back in the book of Acts, chapter 9. And... Uh, so let's look at how Ananias responds to uh, the vision that he has from God uh, that says, get up, go to the street called Straight, and look for a guy from Tarsus named uh, Saul, who's at this moment, who's praying, uh, uh, which I, you know, we're, 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 I haven't talked about the idea that both of them obviously were probably in a spirit of prayer or in some disposition to to hear from God uh, but we do know that Saul is praying specifically the text says that um, and at that time he's seen a vision that Ananias is going to come and lay hands on him and he's going to regain his sight so if somebody would read verses 13 and let's go to let's go to 19 so if somebody read 13 through 19 that'll probably set us up for the remaining time All right. All righty, thank you. So uh, Ananias um, protests. I think I would have too, right? Uh, you know, um, it's real easy to read the text. Say, oh yeah, you know, you know what's going on. It's no biggie. And but I, I, I think I would have been sitting on the couch, and uh, ha I need some convict uh, con convincing, which obviously Ananias did because God gives more information than just get up and go. Right, and the first one is get up and go, and uh, Ananias pro has a protest, and then the response uh, is God gives him more in more information. He's going to be my instrument that I've chosen for the name to the Gentiles, um, and uh, and then I myself, being God, will show him, being Paul, how much he will suffer for the sake of Christ. Um, so the, his protest is overruled. And, um, you know, I, so one of the questions I asked of myself is, um, because I, I will be up front and admit that I probably would not have said yes right off the bat. I hope that I would have said yes even after uh, the secondary answer. But here's the question. How many times do we know what we should do, but we do not because of fear? Too many. All right. So uh, just something to think about. Um, could it be, it's a follow up, could it be that God always provides for what 
he will ask of one to do. And what's required is just obedience. It's just something to think about. Um, uh, so we see, at least in Ananias, some struggle there, but yet it works out exactly uh, as God gives, uh, as in the answer to the description. Uh, Ananias does go in to visit Saul. Well, first, Ananias is assured that um, that if Paul had inflicted suffering on those who believed in Jesus, uh, he in his turn would have much suffering to endure now for the sake of the name of Jesus. Um, so the response back from God to Ananias after Ananias protested the request Nonetheless, he does visit Saul. He does exactly what God asked of him to do. And in return, uh, Paul's sight is restored. Um, you know, then the, the last question I asked outside of, in my Bible is, boy, how gutsy is Ananias uh, to, to do that? Um, now, in chapter 22 and chapter 26, where we get descriptions, Paul gives summaries where he's, he's given accounts to different people about his life. Um, he goes into more detail. But what I just find fascinating is that God is working on both persons at the same time for something down the road that's going to be very beneficial to the name of God. And uh, I think that's something for us to always remember, that even though most of us, and I'll be the first to admit as well, is very concerned about my own life or my own hinterland, my own family, my own the things I can control, uh, the, the negatives that you can get so concerned with that that we forget that there might be something that God is doing over here with someone else that at some point both of us are going to meet in the future and that's going to lead to something even grander or maybe something that is that God wants to see happen so that the name of God is either honored or glorified or, or lifted up. Um, so again, we come back to that one question. Do we discount one simple act of obedience and what that could be in a in sort of a, a multiple steps with multiple people and for for something that God is trying to create or do and that's just something that we all have to wrestle with um, you know the, the Christians are designed what you don't find in the New Testament uh, is the idea that there are solo that Christianity is a solo act. I mean, you might have personal faith, okay? I get that. I'm not, I'm not trying to discount that. But the work of salvation is always meant, it's both personal uh, and corporate at the same time. And so what God seeks to create in the life of a person is not to be where they're just kind of on an island for themselves. You cannot find that in the Bible, I would argue that there's always some communal or corporate uh, response or act that takes place there. So the idea that we have these long ranger or, or solo acts of, of faith, yeah, to, for conversion, yeah, absolutely. But they're always, I mean, you, you always find them going back into a community um, or being with other people. And so then uh, the reason why I, I highlight that is because your individual personal acts of obedience are always part of a larger story, a greater narrative. Yeah, that's that's coming up in S and ten. Mm -hmm. Right. That's Acts ten. Yeah, so that's coming next week. So, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that you have read ahead. Um, but some of us are still kind of a New Year's, you know. That's all right. Well, all right, so to thank you. Bitsy actually, she, I mean, she, I wanted her to say that. Because, no, you have what's going on in Chapter 9 with Paul. In Chapter 10, you have what's going on with Peter and Cornelius. They'll come together in Acts chapter 15. And then both of them are sent out uh, in various directions uh, by that council in Acts chapter 15. 
which then creates the rest of the New Testament. So, I mean, so these are independent of each other, and yet at the same time, God is orchestrating all of this. I mean, you know, part of um, some, some scholars, you know, the book of Acts is called Acts of the Apostles. Some scholars call it Acts of the Holy Spirit. All right, so you got this idea of God is orchestrating all these things taking place. Now there is personal response, there is faithfulness that is needed in order to, to you know, to to further the message. Um, but uh, all, you know, behind it all is one who's orchestrating these different pieces so that something takes place. I I, I would argue that I'm not sure the apostles knew how all this was going to play out. I mean, because what was the last word they got from Jesus? Go to the upper room. And do what? Wait. Wait for what? Holy Spirit. And then, you know, when they ask questions in John chapter 14, you know, Jesus says, I'm going away. My Father's prepared this place for us. And I mean, the response is, where are you going? That's the first question. Where are you going? And, it, well, I'm, I'm going away. And then it's, well, what are we going to do? Don't worry, I've got that covered. Because what comes next? Holy Spirit. He's going to be the comforter. He's going to be the advocate. And, and, so, and then God just kind of leaves it at that. I mean, that's, what Je- that's really what Jesus gives them. And so then when they go, to, you know, the la- resurrection, they meet with Jesus. He, he does some things to, I think, to really drive home what's taking place and so- what God is doing in Christ. But then he leaves, he ascends, and he tells them to go to the upper room with just one direction, just wait. And then, because once you receive the Holy Spirit, that'll tell you what's left to do. So you're all cold again, right? All right. So, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, it's a, uh, uh, are you eight? So, uh, um, hmm? all right, so, uh, uh, because this is not, uh, I don't have a manuscript. Let me go back and think real quick. Uh, the good news is that it's all, rec- it's all recorded, so if I don't get it right, you can go back and, and watch it. Um, so individual acts of obedience is personal, right? But it's always, I, would, I think it's always inside of a larger narrative or a larger concert where, God, where other people's individual acts of, of obedience are being used by God always to bring about something even greater than that individual act of obedience, if that makes sense. Sure, I, I would, I, I'm fine with that. I mean, uh, so, I mean so our faith is, um, you know, how we experience God is it's, it's personal, it's individual. Um, so it's always, whenever we talk about God or we experience the Holy Spirit, that's always going to be in personal terms, right? Because you cannot, you don't know what another person is going to be doing, or how they're going to respond, or even what they're experiencing. But your individual experience with God is is always in some form going to be linked to someone else's individual experience with God, which is going to be linked to someone else's individual experience with God. That I think behind it all is God directing through the Holy Spirit to bring about something that's larger that's always going to lead to the glorification of His name. And so that would be either in other people coming into the fold or, or even something that's end time related. Um, as Westerners, and we all are, and as Protestants, we all are, I would imagine, we have a tendency to overemphasize the personal uh, at the expense of the corporate. Now, the Orthodox side of the house, the other side of the church, it's more Eastern, they will overemphasize, they have a tendency to overemphasize the corporate at the expense of the personal. But we have to remember both, right? That's, that's, my, that's my main point today, is that we, you, we don't act in silos. Now, granted, it's personal because it's you and your faith, your obedience but it is not in a silo where you're by yourself and it doesn't affect all those that are around you. And this is a perfect example of this. Paul's act 
uh, his, his individual eyes, seeing the vision and whatnot, is dependent upon Ananias. I mean, because what happened is Ananias didn't go in and pray. Well, now we can, we can con- have conjecture. Well, maybe there would have been another guy. Yeah, we well, could have, so, but we don't know. But we do know is that independent of Saul, God is working on Ananias. And there's, an, there's a point in Ananias' personal faith, how he experienced God, where, where his individual act of obedience is needed to help Paul move forward. Well, there's a corporate component there. And, um, and you could make a case that even though it isn't described in Acts chapter 10, but when Ananias gives a rebuttal, well, I don't want to do it. Right? This guy's dangerous. I don't know if you're aware of God, but he kills people like me. Right? That's the answer. Don't want to do it. God gives Ananias a little bit of insight into something that's going to happen way down the road. This guy is my instrument because of what's going to happen to the Gentiles. Now, he's going to have great suffering. That's, that has nothing to do with you. But I, if you don't do this, that might be limited. So our individual faith, personal, personal acts of obedience are in concert with what's going on with the people around them. All right, so some of you play the handbells, right? Or have played the handbells at some point or fashion. What happens if one person doesn't ring their bell when they're supposed to? It's not just a hole in music. It sounds terrible. I mean, you can't even cover that up. I mean, you know, in a sermon, I got 30 minutes. I can fix it or go around or whatever. Um, uh, but now on that handbell, you know, and even maybe in a larger, you know, obviously if you strike a wrong chord, you know, or note, you might could hear that. Um, but, you know, some you can do a wrong, you can hit a wrong note and still sort of cover it up. But with a handbell, you cannot. I mean, that, that ding, I mean, it stands by itself. And uh, but uh, put all the individual ringing in concert with everybody else sounds beautiful. Well, I mean, that's what's going on here in, in the text. And I mean, we could even argue that it, I mean, now this is very clear in Acts chapter nine, but you can see some of that going on even before nine. And you're definitely going to see it more even after nine. But this this sort of slows it down for us to see the acts of God and how you have two people that are independent of each other who are responding to what God is doing inside of their individual life. But they're doing it in concert with each other, even though they don't, they're not aware of that. And that's going to lead to something greater in the future. They're not aware of it. And Ananias gets about this much of a glimpse of it. At least God says this. Let me give you some. Let me give you some help, um, so that you will do what I ask you to do. Um, but there's, you know, one act is needed so that the next act can take place. Uh, how many of y'all know the name of Mordecai Ham? The ring a bell? Vaguely. How many of you know the name of Billy Graham? All right. So you know how Billy Graham became a Christian. Mordecai Ham was preaching. He's almost lost to history. Now, he's very famous as an evangelist, but nowhere near as famous as Billy Graham. So what if Mordecai Ham said, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to preach that night. Because if you read Billy Graham's books, he didn't want to go to the evangelistic service and actually protest. Told his parents he was not going. It wasn't until they left to go that he picks up a news article and reads about Mordecai Ham is talking about what's going on inside of his school at that time. And so Billy Graham, what he wrote in his, his book, I forgot what the name, maybe it's not just, I don't know, I'm sure what one of his, one of his books uh, basically said, well, maybe I need to go check this guy out because at least he knows something about the school that I attend. So he goes, and he sits, and he listens. And then Billy Graham's own words will say, I can't even remember what he preached about. But I know that something took place inside of that preaching and in that service that forever changed my life. All right. So that's just another version of Acts chapter nine. So don't discount 
those urges that you get from the Holy Spirit to just do the next right thing. You have no idea what that's going to do down the line. And there are countless examples of this. I mean, it's even in the Old Testament. Go back to Samuel and Eli. Remember that story? So Anna's, Hannah, Hannah's barren, has a child, gives him to the temple to be sort of a, it's kind of an aqualite, it's really what he is. And he has a vision, has a dream. And so Samuel gets up, goes to Eli, who's asleep in another room, and says, hey, you called me? And Eli wakes him up, says, no, I didn't. So Samuel goes back, wakes up again. Two, three times he does it. So finally, at some point, Samuel, either from God or just has is is been around God in the temple enough to know how it works, said, instead of you coming to see me next time, just say, here I am. Well, what happens? He goes back and says, here I am. And guess what? He has, he has an interaction with God, which then Samuel becomes the chief prophet of his day. And was countless, I mean, was very helpful in Saul's life, very helpful in David's life, and all the other people in this transition of monarchy that was needed to form Israel's base. So you just don't know what one individual act is, is going to do. What if Samuel just said, shut up, little boy, and go to sleep? <laughs> well, now, it would have made a good story in Samuel, right? I mean, you know, we had to find something else in First Samuel, you know. But what if? So we don't know. I mean, but what if Ananias just said, no, I ain't doing it. This guy's dangerous. I'm afraid. Something to think about. Um, we have no idea what one individual act of obedience can do inside of this greater narrative of what God is trying to create and accomplish in the lives of people. And Acts chapter 9, I would argue, is one of the best examples of this inside the Bible. They have no clue what's going on, and yet the Holy Spirit's working behind the scenes to bring about what's going to be a the number, not the only, okay, but the principal evangelist to the Gentiles. All right, so just to help you, are you a Gentile? All right, how many of how many? All right, so let me ask it this this way: How many of you were born of a Jewish mother? Then you're not a Jew. That's why it's not a Jewish dad, it's a Jewish mother. So then everybody else in here are Gentiles. Which means then if you trace your faith history back, guess where eventually it lands on? Paul. Well, who was instrumental in helping Paul? Ananias. And he's lost to history other than Acts chapter 9. He is a, he is a blip on the screen. But without it, I'm not sure Paul would have become the person that he... That he, he was, even with God. So don't discount the individual acts of obedience that you think are just uh, meaningless. They are not. You have no idea who's watching. Uh, I mean, you just don't. And, uh, and you have no idea how that's not going to be used to, to make a difference in, in, in the life of a person. I was in college one time, and... Uh, this was I became a Christian going into my senior year of high school, and uh, so it's probably maybe I think I was a junior now in college, and I wasn't quite sure. I mean, at that point, I wanted to be an attorney. I thought that's what my life was going to be, and um, I was sort of wrestling with the idea of, of should I go into the ministry. Um, really resist that because I I mean I also grew up in the Jim Bakers and the Jimmy Swaggerts and, and time. And so, I, I mean, I'm, seriously, I thought ministers were, why would anybody want to go into the ministry? They're, they're, just, they're, just, not, they're just not change agents. I mean, I, it's embarrassing is what I thought. Uh, so really was resisting that, but was involved in the church and was, was really kind of throwing myself into the church for growth and, and what was going on inside my own life. I remember one night, I uh, went back to, to my room, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and it was after a Bible study that I was in, and I think the study was over around eight eight thirty, and so I was walking back to my to my room, and uh, clear as a bell, I mean crystal clear, it was you need to call said person. Now this person was a friend of my little brother. I really didn't know him that well, and I thought, all right, you know, this is this, you know, maybe we were studying Acts chapter nine, I don't know, and 
And uh, so I thought, okay, I'll do it. So I went, went home, got on the phone, called the guy's number, and it didn't, I mean, it just, it just, uh, just all it did was ring. Nobody answered. And I thought, all right, I've, I've done what you asked me to do, God. It, you know, it's no, no big deal there. And then so uh, immediately was, no, I didn't ask you just to dial the number. You need to call and talk to, and again, the guy's name. And so I uh, sort of wrestled with that because I was really worried about being people calling me a Jesus freak. And so I'm dead serious. I, was, I don't want to be known as a Jesus freak. And because uh, I, I still fancy I want to be an attorney, right? And uh, so um, I, about 10, 15 minutes later, I just kind of debated back and forth, finally called him. And the guy answered, and he said, did you just call me? He said, I was working out, you know, in, in my basement. And when I got to the phone, it stopped ringing. And so I didn't know what to do. This was kind of a, I felt like I was just out of my, out of, out of my sorts. And uh, I said, well, I said, you're going to think I'm a nut. And if, if I am, just say it right off the bat, I'm a nut. And that's fine. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I said, I was, you know, long story. I mean, I was at a Bible study. I was walking home from the Bible study, going back to my room. And I was just overwhelmed, this overwhelming feeling that I needed to call you. And he goes, I'm so glad you did. He said, I've been wrestling with this. And he said, I don't know what to do. And so I said, well, I'm, I'll come see you. And so I went over to see him and, and prayed with him to accept Christ that night. For, forever changed. I still see him every now and then. Still, still, still a follower of the way. My point is, you have no idea what one small act of obedience can do. Because behind it is one who's directing the concert. And your story is part of a greater narrative that sits under God. And Acts chapter 9 is a perfect example of it. All right? So that's a good ending point. So you gotta, as a preacher, you've got to end it on an emotional story. So let's pray, <laughs> and we'll be dismissed. Oh, God, as we really fashion ourselves inside of the Acts chapter 9, we're mindful of um, all the wonderful things that you do. And we, we've been receivers of this. And, and really the, the, the overwhelming thing is that we probably will never know all the individual acts of obedience that led to the person that we are today. We can only control what we can control, which is our own life. But we're grateful for how other people's acts of obedience have led to, to who we are and what we are today. We also know that the story is not over and that you still need our individual acts of obedience because of what's going to happen tomorrow, and maybe even the day down, down the road, or maybe even the person that we will meet even years from now. We're grateful that you include us into this narrative, into this story of, of the, the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so when we're like Ananias, and there's just, it's unclear, and there's even fear around decisions and things that we need to do help us to have a sense of discernment and a sense of clarity but when it becomes crystal clear give us a sense of boldness and a sense of of direction and strength to walk in those ways we give thanks for your love and mercy uh, always O god and for what the redemption that we have in jesus christ and how that plays out in so many different ways and in so many different lives uh, we're grateful and we're honored by it. And we pray this in your name. Amen.